Uh, all right. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, welcome to this webinar on uh, Port Site Hernia, uh, organized by Medtronic in collaboration with uh, IRCAD. Uh, my name is Arthur James, and I am uh, head of upper GI surgery and trauma surgery at the Department of Surgery, Sundsvall, Umeå University in Sweden. Uh, tonight, we will try to bring some light to an everyday problem for a lot of patients during uh, around the world when undergoing laparoscopic surgery. And to help uh, me with this, I have uh, two experts in this field, and it's uh, Dr. Van der Veld from Amsterdam. Welcome. And uh, Dr. Paolo Berndante from Italy. You're also very welcome. Uh, there, in this field, there's uh, rather poor scientific knowledge of what we are doing and how to manage uh, port site problems. And hopefully, after this um, session, you will have a deeper understanding in this on this problem. And I will start this session by some, um, let's see if this works. Can everyone see this now? Um, we have some rules here. Uh, and if you want to ask questions, which you should, we will answer them uh, at the end of this uh, webinar. And you can uh, ask questions in the chat or in the QA panel. Uh, as you can see, this webinar is recorded by Medtronic for training purposes. And it's not, um, uh, you can't share this data with anyone else. So this is uh, um, what you have. And when you registered, we sent you some questions and we are going through the answers of them. And as you can see, most of you uh, are general surgeons performing laparoscopic surgery, but uh, also we have uh, corrective surgeons and gynecologic surgery as well as the, in this webinar. Uh, we asked the question, is port site hernia a problem? And most of you said yes, which is interesting. Uh, so, some of you said, I'm not sure. And that's probably because you don't look. Uh, and no, some surgeons have no problem at all. Uh, and we asked the question, what is your experience in the port side hernia field? And uh, most of you said that you did not have any uh, expertise in this area, which is interesting. Uh, which Susanna van der Welt, after these uh, questions, will try to answer. So this is uh, what you send us. And now back to some polling questions that hopefully will be answered during this session. And should we start with polling question one? And here you can answer and we will get the results of the 20 seconds. And as a laparoscopic surgeon, I perform mostly. And uh, please uh, click on the alternative and submit. This will give us uh, some uh, information on, on who we are speaking to. And as you can see, most of you are gastrointestinal surgeons and we have some um, gynecologists too. I would bring um, bariatric surgery into general surgery as well. Should we take pooling question number two? Uh, if the medical history is expected a troch or cytonia, what do you do to detect it? And please answer, is it physical examination? Is it ultrasound? Is it CT scan, all three or other? Very 
very interesting physical examination and all three uh, and otherwise none that's good information thank you and we will go with pooling question number three uh, do you close trocar sites over 10 millimeters over 12 millimeters or five millimeters all or none and of course you can answer give two answers here or three or Yes, interesting. Most of you uh, close trocar sites over 10 millimeters. Perfect. Excellent. And pulling question number four, the last one before we start this session. Uh, extraction site, my favorite extraction site when you pull out the specimen. Is it the umbilical port? Is it midline epigastrical? Is it lateral? Is it a funnel steel or other? Interesting. Most of you bring out specimen through umbilical port. Well, thank you very much for these polling questions. And to move on, Susanna, it's uh, the floor is yours, and you will perhaps give us some background information and knowledge on trochor site hernia. <laughs> Unmute. Yes. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to tell you something about uh, uh, trochocardite hernia and what is known up till now, uh, uh, according to literature. So very interesting to see the polling questions, actually. So one third of you is not sure if there is a problem with uh, trochocardite hernias. And a lot of people in the audience don't have any experience of low experience with trochocyte hernia. So this may come as, a, as new information for you. And it's also very interesting, keep that in mind to see that 60% of you take out a specimen via the umbilical port. So that's also interesting. I am really looking forward to see how you think about it after this presentation. Um, well, I would like to go to the next slide. I will do it here. So I'm going to take you through uh, um, the next content. So I will uh, give you a definition on trochocyte hernia, also about tell you something about the incidence of trochocyte hernia, uh, risk factors that are known, especially in the bariatric patients. Also, I uh, will tell you something about the, the, the way to detect a trochocyte hernia, how we can prevent it, and some take home messages. So, of course, the definition of trochocyte hernia is an incisional hernia at the side of a previous trochar position. And actually, there are three kinds of um, trochocyte hernia. So there is an early onset one, which is uh, most of the time within two weeks after surgery, and it presents with a small bowel obstruction. Then there's a late onset uh, trochocyte hernia, which is months to years, and it presents with a real hernia sac. And also most of the time there's just uh, omentum or uh, visceral um, fat inside this sac with uh, some complaints of pain. And there's this very rare immediate postoperative uh, trochocyte hernia, which is actually, which happens because you take out the trochar and with it, like in a vacuum system, you get out the fissuration from the abdomen. Um, and of course, this is only published a few times in literature. Um, the problem with trochocyte hernia is that the incidence is uh, varying a lot between uh, half, a, half a percent until one third of the whole pa patient population. And it has to do with uh, two different things. Actually, it has to do with the difference in length of follow-up. Uh, the longer you look at your population, the more trochocytes you find, hernias you find. And also uh, there's a difference in detection technique. So um, especially with the retro retrospective data, it's most of the time patient reported and needing uh, additional surgery. 
but um, there's also a group that is uh, found by physical examination alone or by um, additional uh, imaging like ultrasound of CT scan. I will come back to that later. Um, so what are the risk factors for developing a trochocyte hernia? This report was uh, published last year uh, and it showed a multivariate analysis about uh, different risk factors. And what you see here is, is that obesity is a risk factor, also the duration of the surgery. So the longer the surgery, the bigger the risk of a trochocyte hernia in the end. Also age above 70, diabetes, incisional enlargement, which means that if you enlarge the trochocyte incision, for example, to get a retrieval of a specimen, then this is also a risk for a trochocyte hernia and also a wound infection. Um, after a wound infection, there is a bigger risk of an, of an hernia at that point. So what you see here is that there are three big studies done uh, with retrospective data, and I will take two of them. Uh, I will uh, light them more. So one of them is the study by, uh, that's done, uh, published in 2014, and it's a prospective study about three years of follow-up with ultrasound uh, of patients that received a laparoscopic cholestectomy. And uh, what they did is they looked at all the patients after three years, uh, especially with ultrasound in all the trochar region, regions. And what they saw is that a quarter of the patient had a trochocyte hernia. And then they uh, uh, dist distracted for the risk factors from that. And they saw that same things, age, diabetes, a higher BMI, a facial incision enlargement, a wound infection uh, was a risk factor. But they didn't see any trochocytes in the left upper quadrant 10 millimeter port, which is important to note here. Also, the other big study about the risk factors is a retrospective 10 year follow up study. And here the trochar uh, side hernia was defined as additional surg surgery needed. So you can imagine that, it, that patients that with only with symptoms that more need uh, additional surgery are less than if you look at it with an ultrasound. So they only found less than 1% of the patient had a uh, trochocyte hernia. And when they did the analysis, uh, especially the multivariate analysis, they only found obesity as a uh, risk factor. All the other ones were uh, on, only on unidifferent analysis. So about these bariatric patients, because uh, as I saw just in the, in the pooling data, 9% uh, of you are bariatric surgeons. So uh, for bariatric patients, we of course uh, perform special surgery. And what we see um, is that they need ex extra attention for their trochar sites to prevent their hernia. So two uh, big retrospective cohort studies were done with a group that was, the fascia was closed and the other group didn't get their fascia closed. And um, this uh, analysis was done with patient reported outcomes. And what they saw is that if you close the group, then there's less trochar side hernia than in the other group. Uh, so this uh, recommends closure of the fascia. And another uh, study published two years ago uh, looked really at one uh, trochar site, so not the retrieval site, etc. cetera. Um, and they did a single center study, uh, perspective observational, because they had a historical non-closure group and a closure group um, uh, that was uh, uh, pr prospectively uh, studied. And they had a closure device, which took them only 60 seconds extra of OR time. So there was not the time uh, there was no difference there in OR time. And when they did, did a one-year follow-up with a CT scan, so again, this is not a physical examination or patient complaints, then they found an epigastric uh, trochocyte hernia rate uh, of the closure group versus the non-closure group, which was two times as big in the non-closure group. So they also state that closure leads to less trochocyte hernias. But... Of course, there are always two sides to the story. And this interesting prospective cohort study, the Herbals study, uh, actually followed up a lot of patients with ultrasound. They find high numbers of trochocyte hernias, so up to a third. And they didn't see any difference between closure and non-closure. And this closure was done, the facial closure was done under camera vision of the 12 millimeter port. 
So we didn't know why this is, but I think it really needs a, a randomized controlled trial to really uh, find out what is better. Then about the detection of the trochocyte hernia, this picture actually is from the previous herbal study. And so if you look at them um, uh, with, with ultrasound to a trochocyte, then probably you will find a lot of these pictures. And the question is, is here a real um, a defect? Is there an incisional hernia? And so uh, there was also a review performed about how you should diagnose an incisional hernia. And this is about all incisional hernias, but it gives a really uh, interesting data. Uh, especially if you, if you look at ultrasound and CT scans, you see that there is a lot of additional incisional hernia diagnosis, but also that there's a big inter-observer variation for, um, for the observation of CT scans. So all, not all radiologists and surgeons agree on whether there is a trochocyte hernia. And um, last but not least, a lot of trochocyte hernias are only detected on imaging techniques and not uh, because the patient have complaints. So how we, can we prevent it? Because it's still, whether it's 1% or it's one third of your population, it still can be a problem. And um, two interesting big review studies have been done in have been published in 2011. This one is the Danish group by Biscard, uh, which looked at about 30,000 uh, patients and they saw that their overall incidence was between zero and 5%. Most often these uh, trochocytes were uh, found in the umbilical region and by ports that were bigger than 10 millimeters. So, um, and also they state that a non-closure group had bigger uh, numbers of trochocyte hernia. And they come up with a very nice uh, table with recommendations how to prevent it. And actually they say that the entry side don't, doesn't matter. So how you get your pneumopyritoneum doesn't matter in getting a trocar uh, in the end. And also um, they state that they don't think that there's a difference in different trocar types in developing a trocar uh, side hernia. They say, say, of course, that their stroke size is uh, better. So the bigger, the bigger risk for an hernia. And also the location here is predominantly the umbilical side and the midline. Um, they state that it should be recommended to put in a, fasci a, a suture at the uh, fascia level in uh, all ports for, that are bigger than 10, 10 millimeters. And also they state that you should use slowly absorbable or non-absorbable material. And of course, we know that a lot of us will use Vicro, which is not uh, recommended by this group. Um, and funny enough, they don't see obesity as a risk factor yet at that time, but this was published in 2011. And as I showed you earlier, that data was of 2020. So obesity is a risk factor. So, funny enough, in the same year, 2011, the group of Des Winter in Ireland came also up with a review of, uh, of about 12,000 patients with a mean follow-up of two years. And their trochar side uh, hernia incidence was a big, uh, much lower. And that has to do with um, the definition that uh, a trochar side hernia was defined as surgical need, additional surgery needing. So that means that the numbers were lower and uh, strangely enough, they saw lower trochocyte hernias inside bari bariatric patients than, for example, the colorectal patients. It was three times as high. They also state that the port size correlates to the incidence and that it's recommended to uh, close all 10 millimeter ports or more. And they also state that the midline, especially umbilical ports, are very prone for trochocyte hernias. But funny enough, they state that bladeless trocar seem to reduce the incidence of trochocyte hernia compared to uh, bladed trocars, as you can see here in the, uh, in, in the picture, or the pyramidal or the conical uh, trocars. And they state that the bladeless ones are the ones that leaving a smaller hole behind, so actually less than 10 millimeter port. So another way to present an incisional hernia, which uh, gets a lot of attention these days, is to already mesh enforce your incision, um, especially in a higher risk patient group. 
And so this is the statement also in this meta, meta analysis, but that it um, contained only one RCT on trochocyte hernia. And this is this, this uh, RCT was uh, included in the review and it's mass versus suture in a patient group with high risk factors. So over 65 years old, diabetes, COPD and uh, obese. And they put, it, put uh, all the patients in two groups. Um, one group got a non-absorbable suture and the other group it got um, a mesh with that. And they looked at pain at 24 hours and they followed up the patients with a CT scan, clinical and CT scan to find a trochocyte hernia. And what they found is that um, in the suture group, again, this was done by uh, ultrasound uh, or a CT scan even. So the numbers of trochocyte hernia are high again. And what they found is that in the suture group, there was one third of the patient had a trochocyte hernia, but in the mesh group, it was a lot less. And it was statistically significantly different. Also, they found that in the suture group, there was uh, more wound infection than in the mesh group, and they saw that the pain was more in the suture group. So they say that in high-risk patient groups, you can consider a mesh as a prevention of um, uh, a trochocyte hernia. So what about the retraction side? So we already know that enlargement of the trochor can be a risk for developing trochocyte hernia. But also if you look at the lab cholestectomy numbers in this interesting randomized controlled trial in which they just divided the groups into a retraction in the sub wide port or in the umbilical port, they saw a lot less um, trochocyte hernias in the when the retraction was done via the silk south white port. So they say, really try to omit to use the umbilical port for that. And also in laparoscopic colectomies, um, it was stated that if you use not the midline, but the uh, lateral to the linea semilinearis, then you will find um, less her trochocyte hernias than if you use the midline for the, your uh, specimen extraction. So that's something to keep in mind since 60% of uh, uh, the participants tonight use the umbilical port to get their specimen out. Think about one of the other ports. So to conclude, some take home messages. So the trochocyte incidence varies a lot depending on the way you detect it and also how long you look at your patients. Uh, the midline, especially the umbilical side, is prone for trochocyte hernias. And you can prevent it by closing the trochocytes bigger than 10 millimeters or um, smaller if you, you manipulated them. High risk patients, uh, which are the patients older with diabetes, COPD, and uh, that are obese, uh, you can uh, you you can present the trochocyte hernia with an intraperitoneal mesh or at least close them with a slow absorbable or non-absorbable suture. And for this extraction side, please choose the non-midline side and the non-umbilical side. So that was my presentation. I'm happy to take the questions in the chat and I will ask the, uh, answer them after uh, the other presentations. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Susanna. Uh, excellent presentations giving us an insight in how little we know about this um, problem. Uh, but as I said, if you look, you find. And if you compare it to other uh, studies in the abdominal wall, uh, we can for sure say that prevention is probably much better than treatment. But today, all the, the prevention um, methods are a bit tricky, actually. And then when, when it comes to prevention of incision hernia, it, uh, it's also a bit tricky. So today we, up to and Till today, we don't have an easy um, trochar or easy method to reduce the risk of, of uh, foresight terminations. And, and obesity is, is, a, uh, is a big problem in Western Europe nowadays. So most of our patients that we perform surgery on are obese. So it will be very, very interesting to hear, hear Dr. Fernandez's um, lecture here on, on the trochar that uh, uh, can be the start and perhaps help us in this um, problem because it uh, offers an easy way to close uh, uh, the incision in, in a precise way. So please 
Paolo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Arthur. I'm trying to share my screen. I think that's okay. No, okay. So, good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Paolo Bernante. I'm head of metabolic and obesity surgery unit at Bologna University Hospital in Italy. I'd like to thank the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to share with you my personal experience in this uh, field uh, of minimal invasive uh, surgery. As you know, personal experience represents the lowest level of evidence in the rating system for the hierarchy of evidence. Anyway, let's get started. As the old saying goes, uh, prevention is uh, better than cure. So to speak, uh, nobody wants to reoperate his or her patient for a small bowel obstruction a few days uh, after a brilliant laparoscopic surgery. Trocar said hernias are reported to be more common after, a busy, after bariatric surgery due to some factors related either to the patient or to the procedure. Among uh, patient-related factors, obesity and diabetes mellitus increase the risk of trocar site hernia. Moreover, sleeve gastrectomy, the most performed bariatric procedure water worldwide, had some risks because of stomach retrieval through the trocar site with manipulation of the incision and reinsertion of the port. In order to decrease these risks, some tips and tricks are very useful. Always use bladeless strokers, avoid umbilical and midline port placement, do not remove the specimen through a midline port site, a drain if used should be put in through the left upper quadrant trocar site. And last but not least, always deflate completely the abdomen prior to port removal. Someone around the world is proposing single port bariatric surgery. In my opinion, it should be avoided. Radially expanding trockers are probably the best bladeless trockers to be used in order to reduce the incidence of trocker site hernias. In uh, this paper reported on this slide, uh, there were no hernias detected at any of the some 1500 12 millimeters versa step trocker sites, despite a lack of suture closure in a bariatric patient's population who underwent uh, Rue and Y gastric bypass. At this point, the first question may be asked by the audience, is port site hernia really a problem? In my opinion, the answer is yes, because just only one of these complicated patients is enough. And even some post-op deaths are reported in the literature and more often than not, in the newspapers too. The second question is, does fascial closure make the difference? As you've heard from uh, Dr. Van der Velde, the literature is quite controversial on this topic. Anyway, in my opinion, again, the answer is yes. Fascial closure may avoid the early type of trocar site hernia, which is the most feared one because it often presents as a small bowel obstruction due to the deations of the fascial plane and the peritoneum. On the other hand, fascial closure probably doesn't matter in preventing late onset hernia type. A correct surgical technique for closing the fascial defect requires small bites of tissue around five millimeters on either side of the wound. However, using the classic suture passer technique, even a small miss between needles may lead to inadequate closure. 
Postoperative surgical site pain may be an issue after fascial closure due to the entrapment of the nerves located in the preperitoneal plane. In order to minimize this complication, the preperitoneal plane nerve, nerve plane should be infiltrated with long acting local anesthetic drugs. Some surgeons have proposed recently the method for laparoscopic port site closure to significantly improve postoperative surgical site pain. As you can see in the slide, an endostitch needle holder is used to approximate peritoneum and posterior fascia only from inside the abdomen. And to address the same topic, another brand new suturless method has been published last year, in December of last year, by a group from Israel. Controlled heat induced collagen denaturation has been applied to laparoscopic trocar sites in an animal model, pigs with a device that consists of an end piece with the heating element and the control box, which contains the battery and control module. The concept of wound closure via heat induced collagen denaturation or shrinkage has been previously applied in the field of vascular medicine and cardiology. This process allows a robust, safe and effective wound closure in patients undergoing arterial catheterizations with the advantage of no foreign material at the closure site. At our center, we use the Versa 1 fascial closure system. It is a 12 millimeter bladeless trocar through which an inner white tube can be inserted to use as a guide for shooter closure. The distal end of the trocar cannula has two windows 180 degrees apart, covered by a pierceable membrane. The guide contains the diagonal channels to guide the shooter passer. Visual indicators, black line and arrows, aid in consistent shooter placement. As you can see in this short, in this short video, the black line should be placed at the level of the peritoneum in order to allow the suture passer to exit exactly five millimeters apart on either side of the defect. The procedure is indicated only for patients with an abdominal wall thickness exceeding 30 millimeters and should be avoided in skinny patients. In fact, because the distance between the windows and the black line is 30 millimeter, if the abdominal wall thickness is less than three centimeters, the trocar window will stay outside the abdomen. As you can see, a first year, the first year resident is closing the defect in some 90 seconds. So it, it, it's not so time consuming, even in hands of the less expert surgeons. It can be, of interest to know that uh, the Versa 1 fascial, clo fascial closure system has been recently adopted as a new method to fix uh, a small trocar site hernia in a female patient who underwent laparoscopic hysterectomy three years before. It is indicated by the authors for patient with a thick abdominal wall and a small hernia orifice of some one centimeter. The first step of the procedure is to expose the muscle layer around the hernia orifice. Then the hernia sac is excised. At this point, the Versa 1 trocar is inserted with the guide into the hernia orifice. The first two usual passages with the suture passer are followed by two more passages after the 90 degrees counterclockwise rotation of the system in order to perform a Z suture. I think that probably an online mesh could and should also be added using this uh, simple method. And that's all. Thank you everybody.
and I'm expecting your questions. Well, thank you very much, Paolo. That was an uh, excellent presentation too. Now we have uh, two uh, experts in this field and again, the knowledge on what, on what we are doing and what we should do is um, it's very thin ice we're standing on and it, uh, we need much more um, uh, data, both studies and uh, perhaps randomized control trials to know how to manage both the prevention and the treatment of this uh, kind of uh, problem. Um, again, the trocar, I've used the two actually uh, in the development, development process. And it's the first one that gives an exact uh, uh, locations of the thread uh, uh, in relations to the, to the trocar and um, give the, the, the knot and the strength in the right level of, of, of the abdominal wall. Uh, so it's, uh, yes, it's a start and you should not uh, forget that uh, if you close it with this kind of device, you, uh, you will have no bleeding, which also can be a problem with uh, laparoscopic surgery, especially when the trocars are, are uh, over 10 millimeters, if you, accidentally hit a, a vessel during uh, the induction of the surgery. Uh, to have some follow-up before we uh, let the questions come, we should uh, pull some more questions. And now we go to pulling question number five, David. Can you please, yes. Uh, after this uh, lecture, I consider another retrieval site and you have three options here. And perhaps you're already using the right one after the lecture, so then you don't have to alter your retrieval site. But those who don't. Let's see. Yes, some of you have taken the take home message not to use the umbilical port. Most of you don't use it already and are well, uh, have all the data for your um, surgical practice. Then we go to pulling question number six. Yeah, after this lecture, I consider closing the fascia of the trocar site. And here you can have multiple choice, 10 millimeters, 12 millimeters, five millimeters, all or none. Let's see, yes. Most of you will close the larger trocars, which was the right answer. Uh, it, it, an interesting question I have uh, or comment is that there are animal models uh, looking at uh, defect in the abdominal wall after different uh, uh, trocar uh, diamet diameters. Um, Susanna or Paolo, do you have any clue if, uh, if five millimeters is actually a five millimeter defect in the aponeurosis or bigger after surgery because you're moving your trocar forward and making the... Have you any comments on that before we let the other questions come in? So even a five millimeters perhaps becomes an eight millimeters uh, uh, problem in the abdominal wall. Well, yes, exactly. That's what we saw uh, with, uh, there was a lot of discussion about bladeless or yeah. bladed trocars or py pyramidal or uh, conical. Uh, actually, we don't know it exactly, but the idea is that if you have a bladed, so a sharp dissection yeah. trocar, uh, then the incision becomes larger yeah. uh, in the end. Uh, and we also see that manipulation is a way to, so getting the trocar inside and outside or um, uh, turning it a lot is also a way to, to get a bigger port side actually. So uh, when you do that with, for instance, an eight millimeter port, so the eight millimeter ports are usually used for robotic surgery, then you can also consider to close them after the surgery. Yeah, thank you for the comment because that's what I'm aiming for. The robot, we're doing much more robot 
surgery now and, and the eight millimeter trochus used there is actually 10 millimeters. And there are studies in, in um, animal models showing that the five millimeters becomes an eight millimeters or 10 millimeters becomes a 12 millimeters and so on. So yeah. the, the, the actual also... defect in the, in, in, the, in the abdominal is larger than, than the trochus. Yeah, diameter. and so, some people also say that if you put them in diagonal, yeah. so you don't have the two fascia layers above each other, then you prevent also a trochocyte hernia. But the thing is, then you have more pain in the end. So yeah. I don't know if that's the way to prevent a trochocyte hernia. Prevention other lies in how to close it or a preventional other method like mesh. But this trochocyte that we saw Paolo use is... Uh, a step forward actually I think so should we bring in the questions now um, the other powder should you moderate that or what how should we do this uh, sorry Arthur but I didn't catch oh, uh, your questions uh, the questions I had sent to Susanna was the actual diameter in, in the trochar diameter, the, the, uh, yeah, yeah. the abdominal wall uh, defect is larger than the actual trochar diameter. So yeah. if we, even if you say it's a five millimeter, it becomes like an eight millimeters defect. So so perhaps you should consider closing even sure, sure. smaller, smaller um, yeah. trochars, yeah. I, I, I agree, I agree with, uh, with Suzanne and uh, I can say oh, oh, that uh, regarding uh, putting the trocar vertically or with the transverse path, uh, yes, I agree with Susan that probably is more painful, but uh, uh, I would say that in uh, obese patients, because of the thickness of the abdominal wall, you need to put the trocar in the direction of your target inside the, the surgical field. Because if you put the, the, the trocar vertically, sometimes you need to, to make a, a, an effort to, to work with, with your, with your uh, instruments. So it's a necessity sometimes to put the, the trocar with a diagonal, diagonal path. If I if I can ask uh, uh, Arthur, may may yeah. I may have a question? Um, I would like to to know uh, what's your opinion about uh, one port uh, surgery, single port surgery. Yeah, I try I tried the single port surgery, and I don't think it adds any beneficial to to um, laparoscopic surgery. And uh, there you have a really large incision actually uh, and you are there also if you look at the port site hernia if you this is the topic of this this session uh, you have a big problem how to close it and how to prevent uh, port site problems there actually so i can't see any benefit in in in, in a single port surgery but some, some are using it but i think that's this was a larger issue 10 years ago and I think we have learned a lesson not to use it in in the broader bright board in in, in the, uh, broader sense. So, should I have some questions here? Uh, I have nine questions in the Q and A, and the first is hi. My question is: Does the mesh for an ingural hernia can be damaged during next laparoscopic surgery by trochars? How to proceed if we have to perform another surgery? How to place trochars? Um, Paolo or Susanna, do you want to answer that? I thought, what, what will happen if you have to um, bring a port through a mesh, I think is the question, if I understood it correctly. Yes, I think most importantly is that you put your trochars in the right position. Yeah. So that's, uh, so if you have to go through a mesh, just go through a mesh. That's not a problem. Yeah. But if you you, I think you should definitely close the hernia, the, the, yeah. the trochar side, and then you should close it with non-absorbable sutures. Uh, and maybe uh, put in more than one to close a 10 millimeter port because you have to be very sure to close it because yeah. it will not grow together again. Yeah. Paolo, do you have any comments on that? Yes, if I can add uh, something, I, I can add that uh, 
you can uh, pass through the, the mesh uh, even with bladeless uh, trocker without yeah. uh, without any difficulty. So yeah. I agree. Yeah. The, I agree too. Uh, okay. Place the trocker where you need it because that yeah. makes the operation safer. Yeah, but, uh, but be careful of adhesions there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But if <laughs> you can, if you see it, if you can do it with your... If you your, can see it, yeah. definitely go through. Yeah. As you should do with almost all ports uh, placement during supervision of the optic, I think. Uh, here we have a question too. Uh, would it be correct to say that the general recommendation is that any port of 10 millimeters bigger should be closed. And I, I, we will all agree on that, I think. Yes, yes, if it's possible. Yes, definitely. The problem we yeah. have here is the obese patients because it's not that easy to close uh, 10 millimeters or larger ports in, in the lateral quadrants of the patients in, in severe obesity. Uh, so, so you must have a strategy how to do it. Um, but I think with the yeah. new drug yeah. car that Medtronic yeah. is, is uh, uh, giving us, yes. it's really uh, much much easier, especially in the bariatric patient. Yeah. It's easy and it's quick and it doesn't prolong the operation time that much. So, so yes, uh, I agree. Uh, I have a question both for Susanna and uh, Paolo. What kind of thread do you use when you're closing it? Do you use uh, Vicrol or uh, monofilament? Low? Uh, yeah, Susanna. Yeah, well, the thing is, I was thinking about this today because yeah. we have the special needles, you know, yeah. the the almost round needles, yeah. and it's only on the vicral uh, yeah. uh, threads. But actually, they should put it also on the PDS threads because yeah. I think you you would need to close it with the PDS and yeah. not with the vicral. And we I have would, it, we, yeah. we have it in the PDS actually the ah, UR good. needle. Yeah, yeah, so it's out there. Yeah, the UR needle. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. And so, when I and close the apneurosis with the, this new choker, I use PDS actually. I don't use yes. vibration. Yeah, I can imagine because you don't need the needle there. No. Yeah, and then the other thing is, I think you should not use proline because we see a lot of uh, pain complaints yeah. with the proline and also yeah. threat complications like small yeah. infections there that can be really chronic and painful and give uh, in the end wound complications. Uh, we have another question here. It's the extraction sites. Um, here is one using the funnel still uh, extraction site. What do you think about that, uh, Susanna? Is it? Uh... Yeah, well, it depends on what you're doing, of course. When you do a lab colostectomy, then yeah. I would suggest to use the subxifoil port. But yeah. if you have a bigger, like a colectomy, then you definitely I think we could use the von steel side because yeah. it really knows not so many hernia, incisional hernias over there. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes you can also choose uh, the appendix side, so the yeah. the appendix uh, incision. Actually. Yeah, because that's an, uh, yeah, another incision. For cosmetic reasons, you should yeah. maybe choose the von steel side. Paolo, do you have any comment on that? If I may add, we, we always use... Uh, uh, the appendicitis, the appendicitis incision. Usually, yep. the, in the in the left uh, lower lower in the right or in the left uh, lower lower quadrant, because yep. uh, because we think that uh, uh, the incidence of uh, of uh, incisional hernia usually is less uh, in uh, in lateral in lateral incision yep. than in midline incision. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, here we have, should I close the fascia every time using five millimeter trocars? Do you have any comments on that? I know what I will answer. My, <laughs> my answer is no, actually. Even if we know that the, the, the abdominal wall, the effect is uh, like eight millimeters in, in Adam, uh, animal studies, but, but um, no, I would say. What would you say? Susanna, yeah, I think you should make a differentiation in the high-risk patients. So yeah. high-risk patients are the older ones, the one with diabetes, with COPD, with uh, obesity. Um, and it's actually, if you enlarge the trocar or you manipulate the trocar, there could be reasons to close the trocar site. And I think um, 
in case of doubt, just do it because it don't, doesn't take that much time and um, it prevents a really rare, but also really uh, hard complication as yeah. uh, Paolo already mentioned. I mean, yeah. one small bowel obstruction is one too many. Yeah, but it's not easy closing a five millimeter defect actually because the skin incision is that small. And if you, if you, if, if you saw in Paolo's presentation, if you use uh, fascial closing device, bringing mm -hmm. it from outside and in, you just, you often miss the, the right target. This can be helped yeah. with this new troll car, but, but uh, with but the precise- But uh, only from 10. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Paolo, do you have any comments on, on the five millimeters? Well, uh, usually we, we don't close uh, all the five millimeters in bariatric patients, I think it's quite impossible to close uh, to close this uh, this defect. Uh, anyway, we we use uh, five millimeter strokers uh, in subsic in subsipoid that is yeah. quite, uh, 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 more prone to to herniation, and yeah. uh, the other strokers are all uh, twelve millimeters, so we close. Uh, all the trokers uh, except the the succipoid one. Yeah. Perfect. Here we have a question about drainage, actually, because uh, drainage is uh, commonly used. Do you, how should we think about that when we're bringing in a port? Should we close that too? I think it's possible. It's it's difficult to to uh, close off the drainage because that uh, we have it one or two days postoperatively, and, and I don't see any method in any method in, in closing that actually um, now in my head, and I haven't seen any studies and devices helping us there. You can perhaps bring a suture during operation and and then close it when you remove the drainage, but I have never seen. In, in anywhere, yeah. do you have any? Have you any experience in this field, Paolo or Susanna? Well, I think you could already place the fascial suture there, yeah. which is yeah, then can, the, uh, yeah. the suture that is holding your drain. Yeah. But the the question is, will it stay there, <laughs> yeah. the fascia, when you're manipulating it? Yeah. So I think it's very difficult. But there you could choose the diagonal way to make sure that the fascial layers are not in one line, but are uh, uh, next to each other, so you don't get yeah. a, a hole through the two layers of fascia. Yeah. How do we have any I think that, experience in that? Arthur, I think that the answer probably is that uh, you have to think about the use of drains in yeah. surgery. Uh, today, ERAS protocol uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't use any, any drain. So probably the best choice is don't, uh, don't put draining after yeah. laparoscopic surgery. Yeah, the evidence of drainage is very, very low if you go through the literature. Uh, and, and, uh, but, but some place it, of course, but, but I, I agree as little strain as drainage as possible. Here we have a very interesting question, actually. How to verify the well closing of the fascia? What do you say about that? How do we know what to do? And are we doing it correctly? Well, the the Versa one, uh, if, yeah. uh, if correctly used, uh, is uh, is a consistent method for yeah. closing closing the fascia. And yeah. you can check from uh, inside uh, during yeah. laparoscopy when you when you tie the, the knot, uh, you can see the perfect uh, uh, invagination, symmetrical invagination of the of the of the defect and uh, and you can see you can see that uh, the, the fascia when you when you put your finger inside uh, in, inside the the hole you you can you can you can feel you can feel where your 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 knot is is is, is tying so it's it's quite uh, it's quite uh, Evident, evident that this method, this uh, Versa one, is uh, 
is a uh, it's accurate. accurate yeah it's accurate yeah you know where you put this where the, where the suture is uh, ending uh, yeah. where you have the suture in in uh, correlation to the abdominal wall so it's very precise uh, way of doing it uh, we have several questions about the thread of the suture material here uh, if you should use vicur or slow absorbent, uh, we, we had some short discussion earlier about that, but if you go to the studies of um, abdominal closure, you should use uh, low absorbable uh, monofilament material. But um, what do you think about this, uh, Susanna and Paolo? What are your comments about the material in, in the suture? So I completely agree, use slowly absorbable and uh threat yeah. yes yeah me too Hello. Agree, yeah. Agree. perfect so we, we can agree that use slow absorbable on the filament material uh, so i think we're out yeah here we have the last question uh, should we close fascia in lower left 10 millimeter port site after laparoscopic appendectomy appendectomy which is often difficult due to obesity. I have never seen port site hernia at this location, even though it's rarely close it. Uh, and question number two from the same uh, participant in this study, mesh versus suture. What was the location of the mesh, onlay or sublay? Uh, about the mesh, it was sublay, so intra-abdominal. Yeah, uh, it was a special uh, mesh for that. Yeah. And um, <laughs> the, the thing is with trocar side hernias, I think it's detection method. Yeah. So um, if you've never seen it, it will not mean that it wasn't there. Um, if you don't look, you don't see it. If you look, well, the question yeah, is, I, can, I can agree. Yeah. yeah. And does it always give complaints? That's the question. So yeah. not all hernia gives complaints, but if you really, really are looking for it, maybe a patient will say that they have some complaints that are uh, due to incisional hernia. Yeah. So. Hello. Well, uh, I, I, I have some, some probably some differences uh, regarding the, the, the population of patients that, that I, I, usually, I usually treat because uh, uh, in, bariatric, in bariatric patients uh, uh, in the very first months is, is very difficult to, to, to detect any 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 complaints uh, or uh, or uh, to to think to to have a CT scan because in obese patients you need a CT scan to yeah. looking for to looking for uh, an area a problem we have in uh, in those patients who lose uh, a, a lot of uh, of kilos in uh, in a short uh, in a short uh, time and this is a, a Probably this is a, a this is a, a the, these patients are more more uh, more at risk of developing uh, of developing trocar uh, side hernias because they lose uh, uh, a lot a lot of of, uh, of weight uh, they lose a lot of uh, of uh, muscles because they lose not only not only fat but uh, uh, they lose even even muscles, so you have uh, you have a, a, a relaxation a relaxation of, of the fascia structure. So they are particularly at risk, and the, in these patients, you have to 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 looking for these hernias. Sometimes we we find uh, 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 these hernias when uh, the, the plastic surgeon. Uh, perform the abdominal plasty in, in the in the at the end of the of the weight of the weight loss and and we find that we find that even in five millimeter trockers uh, some uh, usually some uh, fat from from the omentum but but uh, the problem exists it's an interesting question how many need um 
surgery for the port site hernia. And this question can only be answered with large prospective studies, actually, because all the re retrospective material you have uh, loss in follow up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this uh, question should can be answered in the future. We did a study in obese patients with uh, port site hernias, and and one thing we saw was the clinical ex examination. The skin tends to fall down, so you examine the patients in in the in the wrong uh, area, and we could yeah. detect it with CT scan afterwards. So so yes, there are there, but uh, the clinical uh, what, what clinic uh, problems do they have? That's another issue. So you have to dive into. Uh, but now we have one last question after we wrap this up. And I think this is a really good question. You can't look from the inside at your last port site. And that's, uh, <laughs> that's true. Um, but if you um, close the umbilical port with a running suture of non -absorbable, slow absorbable material, you can perhaps... Uh, see the other ports from the umbilical port. Perhaps that's my answer to that. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, maybe you should make your skin incision larger to make, yeah. to make it uh, visible for yourself to see yeah. the fascia. Because the I think stroke, it's yeah. important to yeah. see the fascia and to close it really uh, under vision. Yeah. Paolo? Yes, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Paolo, for excellent uh, presentations and uh, good input on, on, the, on, on the questions. And hopefully we have brought some light into this talk area because the lack of science is rather weak. What should we should do or not to do? We can all agree on that port site hernia is a problem. And if we have larger trochers, you should uh, close uh, close them, both in, in direct postoperatively uh, to reduce risk of uh, emergency problems of bleeding and, and bowel obstruction, but, but even in the long run of uh, uh, port site hernias. Uh, do you, Susanna, have any final remarks and you, Paolo, some closing words before we end this session? I hope somebody wants to do an RCT on this because we really yeah. need it. <laughs> yeah, and perhaps this should be a, a, a kickstart to going home, think in your chambers and, and collaborate and, and, and come up with new study designs and to, to answer these questions. And I must thank Metronic and AIRCAD for giving us the opportunity to, to uh, bring the light to this uh, problem. Paolo, do you have any final remarks or questions? Hello, comments? I'd, I'd like to thank you all for this uh, very interesting uh, webinar and uh, I think that probably uh, a take home message is uh, in laparoscopic surgery, avoid the umbilicus anytime you can. Yeah, thank you very much everyone. So um, does anyone from the organization Metronic or someone have to some closing words or should we just end this webinar now? Well, have a safe COVID time at your hospitals and see you all. Bye. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, Arthur. Bye, Suzanne. Bye-bye.